it's a horrible, horrible thing. Kids lose big chunks of their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't remember weddings, funerals. They don't proms, getting their license. Mm -hmm. They forget they can drive. You have to hide the keys. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't wish that. I wouldn't wish KLS on my worst enemy. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Earrings Off. We want to invite you to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. You can find us on Facebook at Earrings Off Podcast and on Instagram at The Earrings Off Podcast. Welcome to Earrings Off. I'm Lou. And I'm Teresa. Let's get started. Well, hello. I'm here today with Donna White Bailey, who is on the board of the KLS Foundation, which stands for Klein Levin Syndrome. Also with us is Corita Law, who's been diagnosed with KLS. I sincerely thank both of you for being willing to take time out of your schedule to talk with us a little bit today here at Earrings Off about KLS. Welcome and thank you. Tell us about KLS, which is also commonly referred to as sleeping beauty syndrome. KLS is a rare neurological disorder for children. It causes excessive amounts of sleep. It, it causes altered behavior and it, it strikes adolescents between the ages of 10 and 12. It strikes boys uh, 10 times faster than girls. When patients are awake, they eat and go to the bathroom. Behavior is real childlike. They are very hypersensitive to light. Uh, it's mass confusion. They're very childlike. Uh, they're disoriented. And they have a complete lack of energy. Mm. The Symptoms can last for weeks, months, and even years. During that time, all daily activities stop normal activities. Patients can't take care of themselves. They can't go to school. They can't work. They can't bathe themselves. They're unable to communicate where it makes any sense, and it doesn't kill you. It goes away within, within time. Mm -hmm. Most patients outlive it between the ages of 25 to 30. Mm. Okay. It, it's very, very, very bizarre. Yeah, yeah. And Donna, your your son Ryan had KLS. So you you know firsthand the impact that it has on uh, not only the patient, but on the family. Having these types of symptoms, because you've done a great job in, in telling us what it looks like or painting a clear picture of the symptoms. Um, so does having this type of diagnosis or having the symptoms, does it open the patient up to maybe ridicule or folks thinking that maybe the person is just lazy or abnormal somehow? Is there a negative connotation attached to the symptoms of KLS. Indeed. It's, it's really, really bad because kids get misdiagnosed for being on drugs or maybe somebody was, they call it slipped a Mickey on them. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes they say they're lazy and they just don't want to work and don't want to do their schoolwork. Those are just classical symptoms, but mm -hmm. it, 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 it takes a toll on the family as well as if a child's in school mm -hmm. because they're sleeping during classes and they're, let me just reinforce this. The memory is almost like Alzheimer's. They can't remember anything. Really? That that's the trauma of it. The, it's a loss of memory was the biggest thing that, that really, really, really was a problem for us because a lot of things Ryan was saying were very, repetitive and then you know they have food cravings now his craving was 
McDonald's, cheeseburgers, cheeseburgers, pickles, and onions. Mm -hmm. I had classmates. He had classmates that worked at McDonald's that kept calling me saying, Ryan is at the window again. Really? Um, this is his fifth cheeseburger. And you would say, well, Ryan, why you keep going to McDonald's? And, Mama, I ain't been to McDonald's. No, no recollection. No record. This couldn't remember that he was constantly eating. And another craving was ice cream. Some patients have different kind of cravings. Uh, one mm -hmm. little girl said she liked licorice. One liked pizza. My son was hooked on ice cream, McDonald's hamburgers, and pickles with no onions. And mm -hmm. they were telling me that that was part of the neurological thing coming from the brain. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole lot of forgetfulness. Okay. I mean, he couldn't even remember his senior prom. Wow. And so, Karita, I, I want you to share, if you will, then. So have you faced any type of, you know, ridicule or people not understanding the diagnosis? Absolutely. And thank you so much for this opportunity to share. I am so excited just to be able to talk about this because I, I didn't talk about it a lot because of this question, because of the ridicule and the misunderstanding of what it was. You know, you sound kind of crazy. Ms. Donna said bizarre. Right. Ms. Donna is really hitting everything and it's cool to hear from a mother's perspective, you yeah. know, me being the patient. So right. I'm right on though. And I mean, in that I didn't talk about it a lot. Uh, growing up, it was in my high school years, started in elementary school, but it was more so in high school when, you know, friends start to ask questions like, well, why did you not show up for two weeks or three weeks or a month, you know, and it's like, well, you know, I have this sleeping disorder or this thing, you know, you can't, it's like, what do you call it? I didn't even, you know, get the name of it until 10 years of, mm -hmm. of into it. And so um, it's just, um, yeah, ridicule, you know, the, the judgment from, like you said, even doctors can look me in the face and ask me like at 13, are you sure you're not using drugs? And it's like, mm. I don't even, I hardly know what that is, you know? Right. And so yes, definitely. There's, there is, um, a lot of ridicule that comes along with it, but I think it's just from the, the unknowingness of all of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. even with the negative connotation, um, the only way I feel that it may, because, you know, it's hard to judge somebody off on a, a disorder or a health condition because, you know, we didn't ask for this. But mm -hmm. when it comes down to like jobs, I can, I felt that it had a negative connotation when it came down to trying to get, get a job sometimes, because even though there's that thin line in being discriminatory or not, um, in the moments where I would get a job, but I couldn't keep them. And so in that time, and though in that term, like in those terms, I, I could say that maybe there's a negative connotation because, you know, I couldn't keep a job when I got sick. You know, mama, they didn't accept mom calling to say that, hey, Karita's having a sleep episode. She may not be to work for three weeks. It's just like, no, we're going to have to let her go, you know. Right. Um, so, right. yeah, I won't continue on right. there. But right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Donna, so what was the what was the first sign to you that something was going on do you remember i remember very very clearly i was getting phone calls from um south middle school he was in the sixth grade teachers were very concerned about this sleeping and confusion and if you woke him up he was angry with you and he'd go back to sleep and we had a home visit from uh philip mickles who was the like a uh he was a the PE teacher at that time. I never will forget. He came to my dad's house on a Sunday and made a um, like a teacher's a parent a teacher's visit. And he said, Coach White and Donna, there is something wrong with Ryan. I'm very concerned. This guy sleeps entirely too much. And when he wakes up, it's like mass confusion, angry, ready to fight. And then he goes right back to sleep. And you know what we thought? We really thought Ryan was staying up too late watching TV in that room when we mm -hmm. was looking. Right, right. Over the years, it it got worse. Sometimes it was it kind of went in remission, and then it would come back. Back in those days, we had one good physician who was a pediatrician named Dr. Fred Lambert, and when I took him to him. He didn't play with me. He said, I don't know what this is, but this is a sick young man. He recommended that we take him to the Baptist Hospital in Columbia. 
And he went from doctor to doctor to doctor. It takes at least four years to get a clear diagnosis. Well, Ryan didn't get his and seven years later. And two weeks later, he was dead because of all the different medications, misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I look at Corita, she brings me joy because she's alive. Uh, she got a diagnosis early on, so she knows what to do. The, the, the doctors know what to do. Um, they're not giving her all those medications like lithium, Adderall, Xanax, all that crazy stuff. There's no cure for this, not even an aspirin. And they were giving my son some of everything. Really? And for every misdiagnosis, there was a pill or a shot. In the end, uh, he became very, he was, he was humongous. And it was because the medicine had steroids in it. Mm -hmm. And he went from like, when I took him to, to the Baptist Hospital, he weighed 140. When he died, he was at 275. But it was all, it was just all muscle. So I remember Crawford had to order a, 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 um, in, enlarged with a bigger casket. Because he was just masculine looking. And, you know, sometimes God gets all the credit. I watched my little boy trans transform into a man within those six months. He wasn't the little child that I took mm -hmm. away to, you know, get yeah. help. He was laying there in that casket. And, I mean, he was full grown. He was a good looking man, too. But he was just masculine looking because of all the steroids. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to tell you. The KLS didn't kill Ron. The medications did. He was over-medicated, misdiagnosed, and he died of cardiac arrhythmia. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. So I'm glad Farida's here because she's alive. Right. Didn't know, she didn't get messed up in the system. Right. Well, and you're doing a great work by being an advocate. And both of you in educating other people. What causes KLS? Do they know how, what, what's going on with that? And you talked about it being so rare. That makes it very difficult to diagnose. Can you talk a little bit about that? And the prognosis for it. You, well, I think you referenced earlier that, you know, there is no cure, but I think one of you mentioned maybe being in remission at some period. So can you share a little bit about that? As far as the cause, it's like, you know, because it is so rare, it's actually considered an orphan disease, which means that less than 200,000 people in the nation have been diagnosed with this. Wow. And so if you have KLS, you are literally one in a million. So I say that now, but it's, it's that's literally what the numbers are. Um, and so it's so rare, there's no cure for it. Um, there's no medication for it. And so as far as finding the cause, it's hard to do that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you need, you need, you need, you know, there, there isn't a blood test that can detect anything. There isn't, they, they try to pull spinal fluid, you know, to test it, to figure something out, but they, there's just so much uncertainty with it. And so um, there isn't a cure. And as far as the cause goes, there are certain triggers that we, you know, some of us have been able to identify in patterns there. But in terms of the cause, the closest thing that I've read in terms of research was that there may be um, an underdevelopment happening with the hypothalamus, mm -hmm. which is the part right. of our brain that um, you know, regulates our blood, uh, our, our temperature, our sex drive, our appetite, our mood. And so like Ms. Donna said, if we had cravings and we would be easily irritated and uh, you know, a little maybe combative at times, like all of that supposedly they say that, you know, maybe there's a connection between an underdeveloped hypothalamus, you know, but there's, again, maybe, right? So there's still not, that's still not a fact. They're just, mm -hmm. that's just in study. So it's just, mm -hmm. again, no, no, nobody knows the cause yet. Nobody has the cure yet. Uh, and so we're just waiting and trying to share it as much as possible until this happens, you know? Well, then if there's no treatment, what do you do then to try to manage KLS? That's a, that's a rough question. It's not much that you can do, but go with the flow of it. You know, you, it's the, the sleeping episodes are unpredictable. So, you know, Ms. Donna mentioned going into remission, you know, I'm, in my journey, my episodes would last anywhere between seven and 20 days. You know, I think I've had some even go into a two month time. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Were well, you just sleeping? 
sleep 16 mm-hmm. to 20 hours minimum. You right. know? And, 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 and like we do, we need care. My mother, you know, I have vivid, a vivid memory and only one, because yes, our memory is very vague from then. So, but God did allow me to remember certain things. I remember my mother giving me a shower at 13 and I remember being like, you know, mm-hmm. like what is, you know, I knew I was there, but you, 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 you feel like you're not in your own reality. It's like, mm-hmm. you're almost living in a bubble, you know, that you hear, mm-hmm. you hear other patients describe it as living in a bubble. Cause you just, your reality is not reality, you know? Mm-hmm. These are the times when I, this is all audio, no visual, no, no video with these, um, with the recordings. And these are the times, this is one of those times that I wish we did have a video because Karina, you're a beautiful young woman. I mean, you're, you're presenting well, and it's just hard to connect a diagnosis of what you're describing with what I'm seeing before me. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. And that's, again, it's hard. It's like, you wouldn't even believe me because we're perfectly fine when we're not yeah. in, in, in an onset of an episode. I mean, we are just the most perfectly healthy people, you know, right. healthy, um, right. you know, and it's so it's, 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 you know, mm-hmm. to see the other side of it, you wouldn't even believe who we are you know, transforming. Mm-mm. You know, like you said, those childlike behaviors, even right. at, you know, at 18 years old, my mother would come in my room and say, you know, do you want something to eat? And I would do these childlike uh, responses where I would trace mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. You know, in the air. I was like, you know, just ch- mm-hmm. I, I prefer cartoons. The fascinating part that really got me was, and it used to make me cry, patients can't differentiate the difference between reality and dreaming. I know. Uh, I remember going to see Ryan one day and uh, I was crying and he he got up out of the chair and he took his finger and as the tears was dropping, he said, are you real? Are you crying? Am I dreaming? Oh. Moments that you, I said, yeah, well pinch me then so I know that it's really you. And I found out later on they think that it's a fantasy sometimes. They just don't know if they're asleep or awake. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Kids lose big chunks of their lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They don't remember weddings, funerals. They don't proms, getting their license. Mm-hmm. They forget they can drive. You have to hide the keys. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't wish that. I wouldn't wish KLS on my worst enemy mm-hmm. because. It, I mean, I'd rather be physically sick than to see a child go through that. It's of course. Awful. Yeah. yeah. Awful. Yeah. Mm. And then there's no cure. No mm. rhyme and no reason. I've heard that it's hereditary. And all, all research is being done at Stanford University. And that's where I met Corita at, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. near Stanford in California at an international conference. Oh, I remember. And that's an important factor, though. Like, you know, we're talking about how rare it is. One in a million, you know, orphan disease, less than 200,000, you know, even diagnosed in the in the country. And then even more rare, we are one percent of that population. Mm-hmm. African-Americans only represent one percent of the K- KLS community. And so we have to we have to spread the awareness for sure, you know, to make sure that um, Our folk know that people of color, you know, because I mean, yeah. we, do, we can be left out and right. make sure that we are reaching out to, to those and hopefully one day can connect with more of people, mm-hmm. you know, black people, black folk. <laughs> right. Well, well, let me ask you something, because Donna, you said something um, and you're going to have to bear with me. I'm trying to learn, too, as I interview you. But when you said they lose chunks of their lives, you know. And that they may forget a funeral or a wedding. So if that happens, did they, they're not remembering that the person died or, you know, they lose all of that? Yeah, I've, I've, I've connected with lots of families over the years. There was a, a sister and brother by the name of Danny, Donnie and Ariel Faber. And they both had KLS. And they, the, the parents kept the house like a tomb, very quiet. And it was on prime time. And um, it was it was kind of, it was, it was wonderful what came out of it because 
I connected with their dad, who was like the liaison at Stanford, and that's how I got to be a part of the foundation. But their grandparents died while they were in those KLS sleeping modes. And they didn't know nothing about it because they slept through the whole thing. Then I met another co mm -hmm. another another uh kid who was at the senior prom, but that but didn't remember being there, like zombies. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so they lose chunks out of their lives where they can't connect. Well, prom night was such and so night, mm -hmm. but I was in an episode, so they're gonna mm -hmm. fall. Mm -hmm. and they, that's where mm -hmm. that memory thing is, is gone. Wow. And so then, Donna, as a parent, and this is your child, so this is a heightened level of parenting mm -hmm. when you have a child uh, with KLS. So can one of you or both of you share a bit about that? Because I can't even imagine how much attention and care ha that you have to exert with a child that has KLS. <clears throat> Well, Ryan reverted back to almost like a five-year-old. And he was 18 at the time and died at 19. I mean, he was in the room one day with my daughter, Gigi, and I swear they were playing patty cake. And then they start doing this thing where, uh, what's the color purple? You and I must mm -hmm. never part. Mm -hmm. And this, I mean, they were just doing, he was, he had her doing it. Then he wanted to play Jack Stones. Then he wanted to eat ice cream. I mean, the, the behavior was as such. He was five in his in his mind, or uh, neurologically. And I was yeah. I was mommy. Mm -hmm. Never called me mommy since he was a little boy. And I mean, I could he he was if he had known, he was so sick. If he had known that I was actually giving him a bath as a man, he would have never let me see him naked. Do you hear me? Right. But I could take all the clothes off and put him in the shower and wash him and act like we got Mr. Bubble Bath and all that, just like back in the day. And I'm like, this child has reverted back to being child, childlike. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the symptoms. And I'm, as you say, attention. You cannot leave keys around. They can't drive because they, they may go somewhere and wander off. You, you, you can't call the police and say, my son's having an episode and he's getting violent or he, he, he's, he's act, acting out because the police department won't know what to do. They'll lock them up. That constant eating. I couldn't keep ice cream in the house. He, would, he was eating ice cream by the gallon. By the time he gets through one gallon, I'm going... More ice cream? I didn't have sense enough to realize giving him ice cream and cheeseburgers were ch clogging him up. Mm -hmm. So he became, um, what's the word? Impacted. So he was always comp complaining about his stomach hurt. Rub my stomach, rub my stomach. It took the doctors a, 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 a few minutes to figure out this young man needs an enema. Mm -hmm. And it was partially my fault because I was just, to keep him quiet, I was giving him what he wanted. Right, right, wow. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, as far as attention, it's like having an infant that cannot do for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Karina, did you have something you wanted to add there? Absolutely. <laughs> when I think about, um, from from my perspective, you know, as the, the that, that, 18 year old that reverted back to that five year old, you know, and particularly now being grown because we haven't touched the fact that I have not had a sleeping episode in 12 years. Oh and my goodness, that's wonderful. Yes, it is. I, you have to speak to that. But in saying that, like now when I look back on the sacrifice that my mother had to put forth to make sure that I was okay. You know, I thank her often just for making sure that my needs were met. I mean, every doctor's mm -hmm. appointment, she was there. And my father was amazing. He just, he didn't understand. You know, mm -hmm. I will say that, uh, but he was there. They'll be, what, married 40 years in December. They're still right. together. But, but mom was the one who took that. You know, mom is the one who usually does yeah. most of that, you know, even right. when we're smaller. So she picked that role up even in that journey of my life. And I mean, it, it's a sacrifice and it's something that, we, I, don't, I didn't think about often was the fact that I had two siblings 
And so I have thought about now, not only did mom sacrifice, but my siblings had to sacrifice because although they were not neglected because mothers are superheroes, right? You know, they, all, they did have to endure the extra attention that I got. Yeah. And yeah. So that can could cause confusion. <clears throat> Know, just in a young person's mind, it's like, is, is, there, is there some favoritism there? So right. me and my, my siblings probably even need to have some conversations that could be th- therapeutic and maybe healing. Um, not that we have, we have great relationships, but it would be awesome to know what their perspective was as a sibling that had to see that, you know, yeah. I don't know, I don't know for, for them, but. Yeah, yeah because, um, you know, surely some, you know, they had to have some, some adaptation had to occur for your needs to be met. The other family members had to give a bit, um, Mm -hmm. modifications had to be made, I'm sure. So I I get what you're saying, but I don't want to gloss over the fact that you said it's been 12 years. Wow. Tell us about that. Tell us about that. When you realize, Hey, that isn't happening anymore. You know, the story is so amazing. Um, I had my first episode also in sixth grade, like Ryan. I was in uh, elementary school. It was the last class that before it converted to fifth grade being the last grade in that school. So sixth grade in elementary school, my math class, Mrs. Green was my teacher. And the same, my mother got that same phone call. I was the teacher's pet. Um, So way back in, I think that was 1999. Um, is when I had my first episode. That's when that happened. My teacher said, Karita's different and you need to come up here and check on your child. And, and, and she did that. And so from there, the, the multiple doctor appointments happened, started happening and the misdiagnosis just started to happen. And so just to jump through the story from, from uh, in two, the October, 2008. So it took that long, it took 10 years to get, get in front of the right physician, the right specialist to say, I know what that is. I can identify that. Wow. Um, at Emory, Dr. Epstein and, and, and at Emory uh, Healthcare Facility in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, he was the I one who said it. And he said, I know exactly what this is. And he said, but I'm going to tell you something, young lady. He said, in my 30 years of practice, I have only diagnosed two other people and they were both white males. He mm-hmm. says, I need you to know just how rare you, you know, this case is and, 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 and astonishing it is for me to be able to diagnose you with it. So, um, so that happened. So my first episode was, you know, way back in sixth grade, I was diagnosed October, 2008. And then February, 2009, I had my last sleeping episode and it was my grandfather's funeral. I remember I sang at the funeral in that fall, Miss Donna. Mm-hmm. I, um, and I remember, I remember the, the moment I do because one thing about Klein Levin syndrome, for my journey at least, is as I got closer and closer to that last episode, although I didn't know the day, they got milder. So you heard Ms. Wow. Donald Brian driving to McDonald's. That's not negligent. There were moments where we actually were a little bit more you know, aware of what was going on. I remember going to school, going to Columbus State University, and that was that moment where I, um, I, got, I drove and I probably shouldn't have, but I probably told mama I was all right, you know, but maybe I was in a deep, a little deeper in an episode <laughs> than I really had admitted to. But I remember going to class. It was a Spanish midterms and I got in there, y'all, and we're talking about confusion. I'm looking at this, this different language like this is not happening. Mm-hmm. And I remember the only thing I could put was nombre, my name. And I put my name and I said, all right, let's go. And I got my paper. I turned it into my professor and I said, I can't do this. Um, and, and I went back home. But uh, at the end of the day, I had it for uh, 10 years. And in that 11th year, uh, I was, I was, I was freed. I was, I, I'd like to say I was freed. I had a praying family. And mm-hmm. so, um, um, yeah, I, that was my last one, but it's, it's definitely significant that um, my grandfather, uh, I think it's just special, you know, I don't want to take it all the way there, but I always, I had this feeling, I, I'm like, if, if if there's any way for you to make any special requests when you make that transition mm-hmm. into that next, I believe my grandfather begged and pleaded for mm-hmm. uh, my healing because it's just no coincidence to me. I don't, I don't, I just, I can't believe it's coincidental that my last episode happened as he transitioned. So wow. that 12 years ago, 12 wow. years ago was the last time I had to, uh, and I can't say it doesn't follow you in the after sto- the aftermath of, you I know, bet. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you, you remember that when you got sick, because common colds would trigger uh, episodes for me. So now, you know, sometimes you get the sniffles and I'm just like, you have that flashback of really? the fear that was associated with just getting sick, you know, mm-hmm. in the day. And so, uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, wow. no, I am awake. I'm yeah. awake. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful testimony. May I, may, may I, may, may I please tell you how Ryan got his diagnosis? Okay, yes. 
he got his diagnosis from a Dr. Jimmy Pacheco, who was from Peru, who was a faculty member at the University of South Carolina. He was a psychoneurologist and he was a, a professor. And everybody kept telling me, if Pacheco cannot tell you what, what's wrong with your son, nobody in the state of South Carolina can do it. And he got his diagnosis two weeks after he'd been going through all of those episodes. He died two weeks later after he got the proper diagnosis. Wow. But it was just too late. Wow. Because all the medications had done the damage. Mm, wow. Well, and Donna, I tell you, um, I can't even imagine, but you have been a hero in this because you've become an advocate and trying to help others and speak for others. So I want you to share a little bit about the KLS Foundation and about the uh, Run for Ryan event. Talk to us about that. Okay. Well, as I stated earlier, when I was watching the primetime medical mysteries, I, um, I uh, saw the, the two siblings, the fathers, and um, when it went off, they had a hotline number. And I called that number. Ryan had just passed, you know, a couple of weeks before that. I called the hotline, and, and Donnie and Ariel's daddy answered the phone. And I told him who I was. And I had, I had uh, talked briefly with somebody from the foundation prior to his death, but I just wanted to let them know that he died. And they were shocked because they were saying, you know, everything was done wrong, you know. I hooked up with the National Foundation through the fathers and mm -hmm. I became a board member. Right now I'm serving as, a, as one of the board members for the, the advisory. I wanted to do something other than just sit on the board. I wanted to make people in the South aware because everybody that was getting a good diagnosis was up the road somewhere. Even you, Karina, you, you went in South Carolina, you somewhere else. I started thinking, now what can I do to bring awareness? At first, we, the first thing we thought about, we did a walk for Ryan. And it went well, and we brought some celebrities to, celebrities to the table, and we raised $10,000 the first time, and we were working with the uh, Stanford University uh, research team, so we sent every dollar to Stanford except for $1,000, just kept that, just to, you know, step our game up for the next year. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next time, somebody approached me, approached me and said, why don't you do a county track meet? You will track parents, you'll attract children, and just make it a, a, a fun day. So I got with the athletic director, and the athletic director got with the other coaches and directors, and then they decided we're going to make this thing legally, we're going to make it on the school calendar where this is going to be something we're going to do every year. And it just blossomed. Mm -hmm. We had we had girls and boys actually a real track meet. We gave away, man, you know, trophies and and then on the other side of the field, you had your activities with women from the church were selling cakes and pies and bicycles and snow cones. And people were making making things, giving them away in Home Depot. It looked like every agency in the world wanted to be a part of KLS. So that in tune, it, it made the community came together. And every year, everybody looks forward to I don't have to beg nobody, call them. They know. Mm -hmm. We were gonna have KLS, and we 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 this would have been year fifteen, but COVID set in, and we right. had to skip it last year and the year before. But Miss Carita showed up in twenty nineteen, mm -hmm. uh, twenty eighteen. It, it, it's hard to remember right now. I think it was twenty eighteen. <laughs> no, twenty eighteen. We don't. We would always find somebody, the National Foundation would always find somebody to sit down here to have a story to tell about KLS. Well, when I met Corita in, in, in California, I said, look, you're going to have to be the next person to speak. And, and we made it happen. And I mean, when Corita opened her mouth, she had those children's full attention. Wow. I mean, she told that story. 
And then she sang a song. Mm. Ooh, when it was over. And I was like, oh my God. And and I've heard children say since we missed it, is Corita gonna come back? Oh like, wow. Back? Yeah, I'm gonna bring Corita back <laughs> in the whole time. Yeah. Corita came came with another little girl from uh well, that's originally from Hawaii, but she lives in California. Her name is Alana Wong. And they spoke. And I mean, you know, the children at first when Ryan died. It was it was rumored all over the community that it was a drug deal. But now, since we've raised awareness, they now know Ryan is the kid that had KLS. Wow. And that's what I wanted to clear right. his name. I that's did right. not want my son to go down the wrong way. If there was something wrong, I wanted to be able to share it with, with other mothers so they wouldn't have to go through what I went through. And I wanted my little boy to have a clean name at the end. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Karina, you referenced earlier triggers. Can we talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, some of the triggers um, for my story, because, you know, uh-huh. it varies for all of us. Um, but for me, I noticed that stress was one of those main triggers for me. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, when I was 10, 11, 12, I wasn't really dealing with stress. But right. in high school uh, and I start working, I was one of those just such I was so vibacious and just vibrant that I, I start working. And when I was 15, I got a work permit. So I was, you know, <clears throat> right. allowed me to. And so um, until th- th- those times, in my, you know, that when I got older is what I'm trying to say is when I start dealing with stress you know, what stress was to a 16 year old and I, and those would induce um, sleeping episodes at times. Um, for even though I was too young, I wasn't, you know, dabbling in drinking alcohol. I know that some that some some people's stories that are old enough, right, and they're drinking legally. Right. Um, you know, they, alcohol could be has been noted to be a trigger for some That's people. True. Um, mm-hmm. There are a few others as well. But for me, that stress was one of the main ones. Okay. Uh, that always, I remember going anytime I was, I had mid, midterms or anything like that, I would just, I, I go into an episode. And I also mentioned common cold. So like any illnesses, I remember, right. like I never was able to get the flu shot because we didn't know if that would trigger something. You know? Right, right. Um, so a common cold, something about that immunity, you know, it, it, it was affected as well. And it would, it would mm-hmm. take, trigger an episode sometimes. Okay. Wow. And sometimes they would mm-hmm. children start out with um, flu-like symptoms before they go into the into the mode of sleeping: fevers, runny nose, stomach aches, headaches. All that plays a part. Mm-hmm. With Ryan, it always started out with flu-like symptoms that resulted to full-blown eighteen to twenty-one hours of sleeping. Only getting up to use the bathroom and eat. That's correct. That's that's my story too, Mr. So it's it's so parallel. It's scary how parallel mm-hmm. Ryan and my stories are. It, it really is. Donna, you talked about how it was important to you to for people to know about Ryan's condition and to clear his name. Can you talk a little bit about? what that was like for you as a mom, people believing somehow that he did something or he was this bad person. He did, um, he caused this. And you trying to help him during that period. Because that's a hard thing. We love our children. Yes, we do. That's a hard thing as a parent. Yeah. And can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, it bothered me to the point. I remember having a conversation with Benny McMurray, who's a, one of my best friends. I went over to the track field one day after school. He was getting ready for football practice. And we got to talking. And I said, well, Benny, you know what happened to Ryan? He said, yeah, but Donna, you know what's being said about Ryan? I said, yeah. He said, the kids are saying it's about drugs. I said, well, that's, that didn't happen. I know exactly what happened to Ryan and the name of the illness. So I want to do something about it and let the world know and the community know what to do if it happens to them. 
So you know what I did? I got in my car and I drove myself to the Lancaster News. And I wanted to see somebody that would take Ryan's story. And it happened to be a young guy. Uh, his name was Ryan too. He's a lawyer now. He took the, he took the story, but he had heard. He did a lot of a lot of news around town and, and at Lancaster High. He had heard that Ryan McKinney died from dealing with drugs. And I sat the young man down. I said, no, he did not. And I gave him all the information. I gave him Dr. Pacheco's number. I gave him nurses' numbers. I gave him the hospital names. And of course, he checked everything out. And that guy wound up writing 13 articles within that year about Ryan. Mm. And he even reached out to people in other places like New York and Boston and California, where, wherever he could find somebody that had KLS, he got their stories and he put that in the Lancaster News. Wow. But I, I, I really, I thank God that he told me, go to the Lancaster News, put it in writing. Because one thing I learned, if it's not in writing, folks say it never happened. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was my out, putting it in writing. And then the, then I was bound and determined, well, how do I use this as a platform to educate people? And that's when the running for Ryan came into effect. And I'm going to be honest with you, getting that together the first year, I worked myself to the bone to get it down, you know, perfected to a, a T. But it took away a lot of grief because it was giving me something to do and it was making me happy to know that other mothers were were calling saying do you think this could be it do you know that pacheco's number is he still at carolina uh, do you know how i can get in contact with him uh, do, will you listen to some of the, these symptoms and tell me if ryan had them also so i was able to network with people who thought they had KLS. Some of them did. Some right. of them really did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could refer them back to Columbia to Pacheco right. and, right. you know, they would get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I, I, that was the way I, I, I just had to, I had to tunnel that grief into something positive. And that was clearing, not in order to clear his name, I had to get it out there on the forefront and I had to get it out there where people could read, where people could see a picture, where you know, where people could mm -hmm. uh, refer to the National Foundation. I let them know you don't mm -hmm. have to take my word for it because yeah. you can just always log on to www.klsfoundation.org, and there it is, the whole mm -hmm. nine yards. Okay. So yeah. that was the way I did that. Well, okay, and um, that's powerful. Karita, so now that you haven't had an episode in 12 years, what does that look like in terms of your relationships when people knew you when you were in these episodes? How have you navigated that, those changes? Because what Donna is describing is that people judging Ryan and not knowing the truth not knowing about his condition and in some ways speaking negatively about him. But now that you've been 12 years without an episode, how does that look in terms of people who knew you when you were having those episodes? You understand what I'm asking about? I do, I do. It's interesting because I didn't, a lot of people haven't started to hear my story until more recently. Yeah. Uh, when I went to that conference and I met Miss Donna uh, in California, that that moment changed my life for the first time in you know twenty years at that point. Because here it is, when I met Miss Donna, I hadn't had an episode in maybe nine years at that point, mm -hmm. nine or ten years, and so it was the first moment I was able to make eye contact with somebody that could relate to my story. Mm -hmm. And so that just opened up a new world of sharing and awareness. And I want to talk about this. And so until, you know, more recently, a lot of people really didn't know the depth of my story. I would talk surface, you know, I had a sleep mm -hmm. disorder, but that right, was right. 
Um, but going into the details of the symptoms, I just chose to leave out and depending on who that was. But in my life, though, um, I'm celebrated so much. And I mean, just my my story is celebrated every day. Like I get to travel the world now and I, yeah. and I get to be seen professionally um, as I'm an, I'm an artist uh, on the stage. I'm Retta Simone, but I do sing background professionally wow. for the artists. So wow. I've, been, I've been all over Europe and Australia and Japan and uh, God has blown my mind with how I've been able to come out. This, my life after KLS has been quite amazing is what I'm trying to say. Wow. Okay. It's so fitting that um, I, I brought up my career, my current career and that me being an artist um, because um, at, I did, I sung at the, at the event hey, for Miss Donna. I just say, I gave a little snippet of something because it was, it's a special part of my story where my mother, I wish she was on the line to share this part and my siblings too, but they said I would sing, I would just be singing and singing and singing and singing towards the end of my episodes. And so wow. you just be hearing me in my bedroom singing all kind of gospel songs, you know, the wow. mm-hmm. mighty clouds of joy. And I don't even <laughs> remember those songs now. So <laughs> to know that those songs that my mother and father were playing just in the house penetrated me as a child. Wow. And here yeah. I am singing my way out. And yeah. it just so much volume to who I am because I pray and praise my way out of everything. That's my weapon, you know. And yeah. so it's pretty special that who who I was created to be, even, you know, that just kind of, I don't know, it was just, it was, it's weaved into my KLS story as well. Um, wow. it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting. So wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I tell you, um, those are those are all of the questions I have, but I want to ask both of you and, and Donna, um, as a parent. I want to ask you what um, advice would you have for other parents? And Karita, what advice would you have for other patients who are dealing with this? So Donna. Okay. I would tell other parents, um, if your child is, is sick or showing any kind of bizarre symptoms, don't don't ignore it don't count it out as well ain't nothing wrong with you you're just trying to get out of going to school Mm -hmm. check into that thing watch be be very observant i i i I thought myself a lot because i wasn't as observant as i needed to be and i wasn't um aware people need to read when you see something that's wrong I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm a Google freak now. If I sneeze hard, <laughs> I'm gonna Google it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Google it. Uh, get on the Wi-Fi. Get on the horn. You know, research it. Don't take it for granted because could it could be something that you've never heard of, and you need to know how to handle it so it won't be tragic. You see, in my case. Doctors were not aware on this end toward mm-hmm. the South. Mm-hmm. And they made my son's situation worse. He wasn't supposed to die. He was supposed to be like Corita, mm-hmm. outlive it. But because of the lack of awareness, <laughs> mine turned into a tragic nightmare. Mm-hmm. And I was determined I did not want to hear anybody's mom go through that right. because that. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you all. I thought I was going to lose my mind. And after he died, I blamed myself Mm -hmm. for not being educated enough to know you don't take him out of his environment. You didn't have no business taking him to different hospitals and leaving him. He was supposed to stay right at home with me, like Corita stayed with her parents, and sleep it it off until the next time. But I did not know that. Well, and that's what I was going to say, because you loved Ryan. And it is so hard, particularly when you're in the middle of something like this. You know, you're doing the very best you can to manage and to make sure he's okay. So Donna, I already know the type of person you are, that you were doing the very best you could, given the situation. And I'm just thankful that you've found the strength, even with his passing and through your grief, to look beyond yourself and to care for others. 
to be involved, to share your story so that another mom doesn't have to go through that. Thank so you. That in itself makes you a hero. Thank and you. I applaud you for that. And so, um, Karita, what would you say to other patients who may be dealing with such a diagnosis now? Oh, goodness. What a good question. You know, being that I'm on the other side. Right, of it, right. I, all I can say is hang in there. When I say I would sing my way out, y'all, I, I, I would encourage myself with songs like, uh, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies we see, all we have needed, thou hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. I sing stuff like that, you know, mm, to just the voice keep is beautiful. going. Look, yeah. thank you to God be the glory. But like, that is what I had, to, that's what kept me going. So mm. if it's, I don't know if it's, you know, uh, a, a sport that you play, you know, in those moments where you're awake, if it's singing like music for me, music mm. would do it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but just live. And I just say, embrace the present moments when you are well. That's what I have to say. Cause at the end of the day, you don't, we don't know how long we're gonna have this thing. That's you right. know, I was on the, the, the foundation page recently and read that somebody that hadn't had an episode in about six, seven years had one recently. And I was like, oh, whoa, that's a new thing. I didn't know yeah. after that long of remission, yeah. we call it that you could have a, but I'm not gonna be afraid, you know, I'm not gonna be afraid. But at this point, if, you, if you're still dealing with it, you hang in there at the end of the day, Trouble don't last always and they're yeah. right at the end of that tunnel. So hang in there. And I mean it because you, I, I can be honest, I speak to mental illness. I remember being 14 with suicidal thoughts because I was tired. I was tired of that life. And so to. to hang in, you have to hang mm -hmm. in. I told my mom about it and that could be the reason I'm alive today. I said, mom, it was, it was God. It was grace that covered because we don't even remember these things. I said, mom, I'm about ready to take air pill. I can put my hand on. Mm -hmm. Hid the, she hid everything in the house. I mm. did too. She hid mm. everything in the house, you know? So hang in there. It may not be easy. It may feel like it will never stop. It may feel like you'll never have a normal life with a, a, or a, a hopeful future, but you do. And if I can be anything, that's what I want to be. You know, I am. I, that's what I'm hope. Let me be your hope. There mm. is, so hang on. That's what I, that's my words of mm. encouragement to those who may still be living with KLS. And I'm going to say, I, I don't mean to cut nobody off, but Karita left us, <laughs> Lou, <laughs> the track field we called the Rice Building, we were all at the track, and everybody was assembled around her, and all of a sudden, she started singing this little song about something about it. So until we meet again, and it wasn't a dry, it wasn't a dry eye, them kids were crying. Hmm. You just hit this a snippet of until we see each other again. <laughs> look, it's Miss Lou. Look, we, we got time. Look, it just said, the song said, yeah. go ahead. It said, uh, may his peace be with you till we meet again. May his peace be with you till we meet again till we reach that distant shore and we'll shed a tear no more may he give you strength to endure till we meet again my voice is tired, so you don't have to forgive <laughs> well, me. Well, that, that's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. You have a beautiful voice. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much for coming on Earrings Off and uh, sharing your stories. And I know that it's going to go a long way to educate our listeners and inspire people, and in Carita's words, to give them hope. Yeah. So thank you very much. 